First is Richard Spencer. Now, you might remember him. He's a white nationalist dreaming of an ethno state where only white people are allowed. He coined the phrase alt-right. Donald Trump's advisor, Steve Bannon, later used that term to describe the Breitbart news site that he ran for years. Last time I spoke to Spencer was the morning after Donald Trump's election, and he was thrilled. This is what he told me about America then. White Americans, European Americans, in particular Anglo-Saxon Americans, Anglo-Saxon Protestants, were this essential historic people, that they defined it in a way that no other people did. Uh, so, I, of course, African Americans have influenced uh, American culture and American identity. Uh, of course, Asians have and so on. But it really was Anglo-Saxons who truly defined it, who made America what it is, who are indispensable. During that interview, we asked, who's funding him and his small national policy institute? Spencer didn't give us a lot of answers, so we started looking into it ourselves. His nonprofit hasn't filed the required paperwork for the past three years, and the government pulled his nonprofit status this past week. The paperwork he did file does not give donor names. It also shows Spencer didn't draw a salary. So what does he do for money? We found that Spencer's family is well off, and a fair chunk of their wealth comes from something we never expected. Cotton farms in one of the poorest parts of Louisiana. Yeah, that's right. A white nationalist makes his money from cotton in the Deep South. His family owns more than 5,000 acres worth millions of dollars, and those farms have received more than $2 million in government subsidies. We wondered, are those cotton fields and government subsidies in any way keeping Spencer's white supremacist organization afloat? So we reached out to him again. All right, so the last time we spoke, it was uh, right after President Trump won. Yes. Um, And I'm curious uh, how life has changed for you since that happened. Well, life has changed pretty dramatically over the past year, I would say, and over the past six months. For starters, on Inauguration Day, he got punched in the face by protesters, which was seen by the entire world on YouTube. Last month, he got kicked out of a major conservative conference called CPAC. Now, all of this after he had moved his office from Whitefish, Montana, to just outside Washington, D.C., to take advantage of what he believes is a new position of power since Donald Trump was elected. I asked him what it's like to be rejected by people he thought were his natural allies. As long as I've been doing this, I've gotten used to the fact of my natural allies attacking me. I mean, I recognize that my life is going to be one of being a heretic. That is that, you know, we are touching on those things that disturb everyone. So you moved from uh, you moved your office from Montana to D.C. Do people come to your to your offices like in the dead of night, covered up, trying to not be be seen by their compatriots? Well, maybe something like that is occurring. Um, We have ways of uh, of maintaining privacy, to be sure. But basically nothing's happened. I mean, they're. Uh, you know, they they can't protest 24-7. On Sunday afternoons, there's some very polite protesters that will come out. That's perfectly fine. I don't have any problem with them. How are you funding all of this? Because last time we talked, you said something along, along the lines of, like, you're sure that there are some millionaires, billionaires out there that believe in the same things that you do. Yeah, it's uh, the fact is we've always accepted donations. Uh, those donations have certainly increased. There is going to be a major step forward in our movement where these these kind of funds that are coming in are going to increase exponentially. Our, our reporters began to look into where all the funding is coming from. And specifically, they found that uh, your family, you have farmland um, that your grandfather got in the Jim Crow era of the South. They're cotton farms in Louisiana. I'm not going to comment about my personal matter, personal finances. So do you own the farms, though? Because what we've been looking into is that, like, you own these farms in Louisiana. Um, Your family does. You, your sister, and and your mom own the farm. And you've gotten, like, millions of dollars from the government for subsidies. I'm just curious because you talk a lot about how America is a corrupt system and how everything is is, is not working correctly, but you're benefiting off of that. Um, I mean, look, I, I am not involved in any direct day to day running of these, um, you know, businesses. Um, and I've 
never criticized agricultural policy to my knowledge. So, I mean, I, I'm, yes, sure, there's mu so much about American society, government and private that is uh, not functioning. But I, I don't, I don't really, I don't really see what you're saying. Okay, so let me play you a clip from a speech you gave in November that I, I think will show you exactly what I mean. So this is you giving the closing speech at your National Policy Institute conference. A lot of people might remember this because this is the place where you held up the glass and said, Hail Trump. This is a sick, disgusting society run by the corrupt, defended by hysterics, drunk on self-hatred and degeneracy. We invade the world and fanatically invite entire, popul uh, entire populations who despise us. We subsidize people and institutions who make our lives worse just by the sheer fact of their existence. We run up deficits and pretend the laws of history simply don't apply to us because of American exceptionalism. The reason why I played that clip is because you talk about we subsidize people and institution who make our lives worse just by the sheer fact of their existence. Now, is that just reserved for people who don't look like you? Because I, I guess what I'm getting at here is that your family farm is owned by you, your mom, and your sister. Uh, it's like 5,000 acres of, uh, of, of cotton land, and it brings in a, an impressive amount of money, but you're getting subsidies from the government. Uh, yes, you know, the agricultural industry is heavily subsidized by the government. It's been like that since the New Deal. I, I don't know what to say. Um, at no point am, uh, have I been accused of breaking laws. I'm not accusing you of breaking any law whatsoever. What I'm asking, though, is the optics on a person who identifies himself as a white nationalist owning cotton plantations in the South, in a place where majority of the African-American uh, households around there are extremely poor. Um, the, the optics of that look, look really bad, one. So I'm, so I'm asking about that. Two, is that when you talk... I'm proud of my grandfather. I'm proud of what he built. I have absolutely no... The optics for that are, are wonderful. So you, you don't understand how it makes people like, say, me, uncomfortable um, when I hear and when I talk to people who are owning huge cotton plantations in the South, whereas like you're proud of your grandfather, but I know that my grandfather was on the other end of uh, those transactions. Right. Look, I can understand why you have a different perspective. That's what makes life beautiful is the fact that there are different, there, there are varieties. There, people, ha people will see the same thing differently. L let's look at a different country because sometimes we can be more objective about a another world. Let's look at Germany and Angela Merkel. Um, since 1945, Germans have suffered from a kind of guilt complex, and Germans are very good at guilt, but they've had a very peculiar one, and that is this, this, this Hitler guilt, this Nazi guilt syndrome, where all of German history was leading up to Hitler. Angela Merkel, I think probably quite genuinely, wants to assuage this guilt. And she is doing that by being open to mass immigration. But what she's ultimately doing is destroying everything that's wonderful about Germany. Richard, I'm more concerned with your thought process destroying this country than I am with her thought process destroying hers. I can tell you that I have the lived experience of what American history feels like. And I can tell you that having the lived experience in America, like the future is made for you to go and correct what has happened in the past so that everybody can move forward and we can be equitable. But in relationship to the work that you're doing right now, the movement that you're creating right now is being funded by the government, because on all the forms that we found about your organization, it doesn't have you listed as making a salary. And, you know, you got to eat. So if the money that you're using is coming from those farm subsidies, do you see what I'm saying? Uh, I don't see what you're saying. Look, I, I live in this world. I mean, I'm not – I don't know what you want me to be, become a monk or something because I'm critical of America. Therefore, I have to become a monk. I want you to do what, what feels comfortable for you. I'm just saying that there seems to be a disconnect when you talk about America – 
as this corrupt, bad place, and then you're profiting off of it at the same time. I mean, yeah, I, I, live, I live a decent life. I think lots of people live decent lives. That doesn't mean that I don't have radical criticisms of the direction that the country is. I, I, there's nothing to be gained by being Pollyanna and being like, oh, it'll, it'll all be OK because American exceptionalism. That's not a, a very manly perspective on the future. This is something that the left has always been very good at. They've always thought about the day after tomorrow of communism, of utopia or, or whatever. The right's always failed at this. I think the right needs to have these kinds of big dreams. I'm, I'm curious, where do you, your beliefs come from? Where did this, these ideas begin to form? Did it start with your grandfather? Did it start with your father? I, I, I think it started in the womb. I, I think that I do think about the world the same way that I think about it when I was five. But it, it wasn't a case. I think a lot of people want to say, oh, I bet his parents were racist and they, they instilled the... No, it's not, it's, not, it's not like that at all, really. My parents are pretty, uh, very mainstream, you know, Episcopalian Republicans in Dallas. They, they were not... Uh, political radicals or heretics by any stretch of the imagination. But they also very comfortably benefited off of the fruits of the Jim Crow South. Uh, not really. I mean, yeah. I mean, like if your grandfather had such a big cotton plantation and was making a lot of money, your mother got that money. And I mean, they benefited off of Jim Crow plantations. I'm not saying that like they benefited directly off of slavery, but the conditions that and, and I and I do not know the specific conditions of your grandfather's farm. But I would say that the conditions that most people had to work in in those days, most black people had to work in in those days were, were, were not good. Look, I mean, my my, my father's a physician. I mean, it, I, this they have not benefited from these things. But look, we've all benefited from white privilege. I mean, I would never deny the existence, the reality of white privilege. That is a real thing. I think we should be proud of it. I want my children to have white privilege. I want more white people to have white privilege because a lot of white people don't have white privilege. I think this is someplace where you would actually agree with me. Well, I agree with that white privilege exists, yes. But I, white privilege... You'd also agree that there means... are millions of white people who do not benefit from privilege of any kind. I think the privilege... that I think that we all carry different types of privilege, right? I think that I have different privilege from black women. I think that um, as somebody that, you know, makes a decent salary, uh, I have more privilege... Uh, in a lot of financial ways. So I think that there's privilege all around to go around. But when you're talking about white privilege in America, like it is such a huge thing that, that, that affects American society. And I think the work is to break down privilege and not to spread it out. I mean, you're basically saying that you want white people to be treated deferentially over everybody else. I agree with what you were saying before. Basically, everyone comes from somewhere. Everyone has a perspective. Everyone has a privilege standpoint to some degree. I think privilege is good. I think a sense of ourselves, a sense of our uh, of whites having a destiny, of having a purpose, of being able to do things that other people simply can't. I think that is a wonderful thing. That's what we want. Are you able to run your organization because of your personal wealth that that is built on cotton plantations and benefits from government subsidies? Is 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 that how you're funding yourself? Because the amount of money that we're talking about with these farms isn't a small amount of money. This is millions of dollars. I'm I'm not going to talk about my personal finances. Like, look, I'm doing it. I mean, you can, you know, I I need to have some privacy. I mean, you know, I and there are certainly the the organization could not run without generous donations. I honestly don't believe that people are donating in mass to your organization. Uh. I mean, look, it is what it is. They are the donations have donations have increased tenfold over the past six months. Tenfold from what? Tenfold from not a lot. No, as a heretic organization. I mean, we were operating on like a hundred grand. Yeah, it's hard. But the fact is, it's like you have to start somewhere. And I've struggled. But I knew that this was all gonna be a big struggle. And I like struggle at some point because when what I can accomplish when, when you accomplish something and you're struggling, when you accomplish something and people aren't just giving you something, it feels all the better. I mean, it really feels joyous. Richard, this is exactly what I'm talking about, though. You just said when you accomplish something, 
uh, and people aren't giving you anything, it feels great. But farm subsidies is the government giving you something. That's what I'm talking about. The disconnect from like how you make your personal wealth to the work that you're talking about right now, it's right there. Well, first off, I have never been a, I, I well, at least not in the past 10 years or so. I'm not a libertarian, okay? I'm, I don't think, you know, government action is inherently wicked or something. So I, I'm not a hypocrite in this sense. And I, I, don't, I don't know what to say uh, to you. I mean, I, I've said it over and over. Like, I navigate the world in, in which I live. That was white nationalist Richard Spencer. He feels the Trump election is an endorsement of his worldview. Thanks to Emily Harris for producing this interview. If you want to learn more about where Spencer gets his money, go to revealnews.org. Reporter Lance Williams dug into Spencer's cotton farms and his family's connection to the Jim Crow South. 